Now coming to the transport across cell membrane. So transport across cell membrane can happen actively also, can, can happen passively also. So what is the difference between passive and active? Passive means there is no need of any energy. It does not require any energy. Whereas active means it requires energy. And passive usually happens between a high concentration to the low concentration. Whenever any substance is moving from a high concentration to the low concentration, there is no need for an energy spending there. Whenever it is moving against the concentration gradient, there energy is required, which is active. Now coming to the further divisions of passive, wherein we discuss about the simple diffusion, osmosis and facilitated diffusion. All my dear students kindly remember that facilitated diffusion is a form of passive. The name looks very very active but it is a form of passive transport. Please remember it. Don't forget it. Forget it. Then simple diffusion. What is the first rule? It does not require any energy because it is a passive. Then second thing is it does not require any channels or carriers. It does not require any channels or carriers. So simply understand this just whenever any substance is there here the concentration is more here the concentration is less. So what will happen? There will be constant movement from side A to side B. It is moving because of the concentration gradient difference. So oh, if I keep on increasing this concentration, the rate of diffusion is also going to increase. That's why it, they say that it does not obey saturation kinetics. There is no saturation happening because it does not require any channels. So as and when the concentration is increased on one side, we are trying to understand what will happen to the rate of diffusion. In case of simple diffusion, as and when the concentration is increasing, the rate of diffusion also increasing. I increase more concentration, then more and more molecules will shift at a faster rate. So here we are not seeing any plateau. So this curve, we can call it as it is linear and it is non-saturating. Saturating means it has a plateau or a stoppage of movement. And coming to the osmosis, now we have discussed simple diffusion. Osmosis is nothing but the simple diffusion of water. So diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane is called as osmosis. Previously, we saw the solutes were moving. Here, the water is going to move. For example, consider this di diagram on side B and side A. On side B, we have six solute molecules and we have two here. So what happens after equilibrium? Here, we said the solutes are not movable but still the membrane is semi-permeable. It is permeable to water. So water will move from side A to side B and the final equilibration osmolarity will be same. But right now the side B will have more water as well as the more number of solutes. But the final equilibration between their osmolarity will be same. This movement of water across the semi-permeable membrane is called as osmosis. Now coming to facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is this active or passive? It is passive. Please remember it is passive. Then facilitation means what is being facilitated? It is being helped by somebody. Who is helping this? This facilitation is helped with the help of channels or carriers. Basically, these channels or carriers are going to help this facilitated diffusion. But they also don't need the energy. They obey saturation kinetics. We will see to it. And it is further classified into uniport. Uniport means single. Only one molecule is being transported. Then symport. Two molecules are transported along the two or three molecules are transported along the same direction. Then antiport, the movement is in the opposite direction. Like we will see it in this chloride exchanger, we will see it in the respiratory system. And sodium and amino acid transporters, we will see in the renal system also. And glute transporters, we will see in the renal GAT and renal system. Then whenever rate of diffusion is plotted against the concentration for a facilitated diffusion, what is happening? Suppose we have 100 channels. Suppose we have 100 channels. And this on one side, I have 100 molecules. So what will happen? All the 100 will move through 100 channels. But just in case I increase the molecules here to 200. Can all of them go to the other side? Rate of diffusion, can it increase? The answer is no. Because I have 100 channels. Only 100 molecules can be transported at the same time. So that is the reason why it will go for a saturation at some point of time. Initially, it will be linear, but after some time, it will go for saturation. You increase the concentration to whatsoever, all the ion channels, all the channels are being used up here. So there will be a saturation. That's why they say this obeys saturation kinetic. 
facilitated diffusion obeys saturation kinetics it gets saturated that's what, that is what it means so this is all about the passive transport now coming to the active transport what does it what do you mean by active transport it requires energy and active transport also has various classifications like primary active transport secondary active transport and vesicular transport let's discuss vesicular transport first it is very simple vesicular transport happens for very large molecules very large molecules and we will be studying two processes one is the exocytosis another one is endocytosis exo means it is throwing away so exocytosis means if any molecule is thrown from inside of the cell to the outside it is exocytosis endocytosis means if any molecule is being reabsorbed from the outside to the inside it is endocytosis exocytosis is also called a cell vomiting cell is vomiting its content to the outside whereas endocytosis can be of three types the first one is pinocytosis second one is phagocytosis third one is clathrin mediated endocytosis what is pinocytosis whenever endocytosis of liquids happen like water then it is called pinocytosis it is also called cell drinking it feels like as if the cell is drinking then phagocytosis all of us know it is for solid substances it is called as cell eating the cell is eating some solid substances so this is all about the vesicular transport and vesicular transport also needs energy that's why we have included it under active transport this also needs energy that's why we have included it under active transport now coming to the primary active and secondary active primary active means he is like a hard working person it has its own atps enzyme it has its own atp through which it will move the substances whereas secondary active transporters are like smart people they will use others energy and score higher so this is secondary transport for example the sodium glucose co transporter this is the transporter it is transporting sodium and glucose but the energy is provided by the sodium potassium atps from the other side from the basolateral side in simple terms if you climb the stair staircases and steps on your own energy it is primary active transport and you take help of the lift you are reaching finally to a destination but with the help of some others energy so that is a form of secondary active transport in the primary active transport usually the name will have atp in it like atps as you can see here sodium potassium atps sodium hydrogen atps the name will have an atp because it needs the energy and it has to be provided by its own self so coming to the discussion of one classical channel that is the sodium potassium atps this channel is very very important because it is an universal channel it is present in almost all the cells and it is a 3 is to a 2 electrogenic pump there is some electrogenic activity going on that's why it is called electrogenic pump and it is 3 is to 2 we will understand what is this 3 is to 2 then maintains the cell shape this is constantly maintaining the cell shape if this channel is not there what will happen is the cell will swell and then it will burst then it also helps to maintain rmp which we will study it in the nerve muscle physiology it is helping in maintaining the rmp also then it is the one which is consuming maximum energy in the body it consumes around 50 to 60 percentage of energy in the bmr so this is the one which is consuming maximum energy in the body and it has ideally two subunits that is the beta subunit and the alpha subunit the beta subunit is an accessory subunit there is not defined function for it and it has some glycosylation sites it has some glycosylation sites on its tip the function of it is not specifically known but it is there then when coming to the alpha site the alpha site is the active site what it does is it binds to potassium outside and brings it in then at the same time it binds to three sodium from the inside then it throws it out so three sodium is moving out and two potassium is moving inside the cell that's why this is called as three is to two electrogenic pump and it has some other sites also which are important because they can ask you in diagrammatic questions the site which is on the outside other than the potassium binding site is called as obine site obine site some of the inhibitors act upon this site to inhibit this channel and inside we have the phosphorylation site where the phosphorylation happen and the atp binding site both of it is present inside so sodium binding site phosphorylation site atp site is present on the inside suppose if this sodium potassium is not doing this function what will happen is ideally it is throwing the sodium out because the sodium concentration outside is already high because we saw the ecf sodium is more 
but still it is pumping more and more sodium if it does not pump what will happen the more and more sodium can enter whenever sodium enters the water also will enter and the cell will go and blast and burst which we don't want that's why this cell is made this pump is maintaining the cell shape and size